Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and we love to help the well-dressed acquire and care for their wardrobes. Today I'm here with uh, Graham Thompson, founder of Optimo Hats. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this meet and greet and trunk show in uh, San Antonio. And so this is part of our Shoe Shine Sunday series where we sit down with the well-dressed and those that help keep us well-dressed and talk about uh, just you know their stories and their histories while we shine a pair of shoes. So, you know, Graham's got a pair of, uh, of shoes here that you brought. So why don't you tell us, what, what do you have for us today? Uh, they're Corte boots, okay. and I wear these a lot, so they get scuffed up, and yeah. I was hoping you could uh, give me some pointers on how to shine them up we well. Can, we can probably point you in the right direction. Okay. So, so how did you start Optimo? I mean, you know, a lot of people know Optimo as this kind of like iconic hat maker, but, you know, I mean, you created it from, from nothing. I mean, it was totally... Well, the Optimo started, I had, I was very lucky to serve an apprenticeship, and I, I took over the business from a, a man named Johnny Tyus 25 years ago. So was Optimo kind of his business? I mean, that was, did he come no, up with it was that called, name? No, it was, was called Johnny's Hat Shop. So it was a different business. Okay. I, I started Optimo, but it was much more of a service business at that time. And that was one of the greatest things uh, that, that I could have had to learn what really great hats were. Because we had the, I was fortunate enough to, to see hats that had come been made 50, 60, 70 years ago, mm -hmm. back then, come through for service for work. So I, I really uh, got to know what great hats were and, uh, and how they were made. So the business started that way, and then it's the last 25 years we've been... Where did Optimo come from? Where did that name? name? Uh, it's uh, the name of a traditional Panama hat that has a line down the center, okay. and, it, and it means the best. And, and uh, I wanted to always make exceptional quality products. Um, so we, we gave it that name and have been um, focused to, on producing hats a lot. True to the name since. Yeah, trying. trying. And so what got you, I mean, so you grew up in Chicago? Uh, grew up in Chicago, and um, so our, our foundations are in Chicago and on the south side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's where I trained, and that's always been a hat town and a hat part of town. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Detroit, kind of Chicago, that entire area of the country has always been very... You know, worn a lot of hats. Yep. Trying to get your technique down here. Yeah, so just, you know, just work it in. I mean, you really want to work the polish into the leather. What's so great about a cream polish, and I, we recommend the primary use of a cream polish for polishing your shoes, because one, it has the pigment that all shoes need, uh, but two, it has uh, more kind of nutrients, waxes, that are going to help feed the leather and keep it soft and supple. Yep. You know, the hard wax is really just for adding that final, you know, high shine. Uh, but, you know, day in, day out, I mean, really, a cream polish is the best thing that you can use. And a good conditioner like the Renovateur. Yeah. So I've, uh, so I'm, I'm going to put so a little So if you're someone more. that doesn't polish your shoes very often, just a simple cream polish. Well, that's what I, really I, I generally out. use a, a cream polish. Yeah. But that's. Well, this, they're both creams. Okay. So. But just, I mean, a non. Uh, non, like a non-pigmented. Non-pigmented. Like with, with these. So, yeah, I guess I'll put a little bit more. So, I mean, how, how has kind of the hat culture changed, you know, in the 20, 20, you said, what, 20 years you've been? Um, yeah, I think I got into the business at the all-time low point in the early 90s. There was just very few people wearing hats. But where I, uh, where I learned how to do this, um, it was, uh, th there was still a, a hat culture on the south side of Chicago. Okay. A lot of guys that never really gave up wearing hats. Mm -hmm. So there was, uh, we were always busy. And before we were making a lot of hats, we were servicing a lot of hats. And then the business every year got more and more. Into more and custom, more. Custom, custom made, and making hats. And it was, it's also been a process of, uh, of acquiring all of the tools and the understanding of how to make better and better hats. Because that's part uh, of the problem is that as hat bit, you know, factories went out of business, just the know-how of how to make them gradually kind of disappeared? Yeah, it did. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, the, the whole industry collapsed mm -hmm. uh, in, in, with well-made hats. So it's been a challenge because when an industry collapses, 
Um, the first things to go are the machines are not going to be produced anymore, the tools are not going to be produced anymore, the knowledge drops off, and then the raw materials are not there. Mm -hmm. So the last 25 years have been trying to piece together all of that. How are we going to get specialty materials made? How are we going to get all of the tools and the pieces of machinery together to make real hats again? And um, and that's been a challenge, but a lot of fun. How have you done that? I mean, has that been primarily just kind of relationships and random discoveries? It's been a treasure hunt for the last 25 years, going around the world and, and trying to get um, a little piece of, of the secret, so to speak, and, and, and little improvements, which mm -hmm. can be really tiny. But when you put those together, uh, all of a sudden, you know, you can recognize the hat, the, the product getting better and better. We, we also service uh, our own hats so we can see... Um, what our hats look like after they've been worn for a year, two mm -hmm. years, three years, and as they come back in. Mm -hmm. It's the same age. It's the same age, exactly. So our hats, I mean, are hats similar to shoes in a lot of ways, where like the longer you've had them, they kind of patina and become even more personalized. Is that something you see with hats also? Uh, they do, and uh, you know, I can't really speak uh, is, is to shoes, but with um, certainly with hats, they good hats, good felt hats, improve with age the felt continues to mellow and mm -hmm. it doesn't lose its strength. And how is that? Like, how do you see them improving? What about it? They get softer. Softer? Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the hand gets softer. And this is, um, I think it's process of the, of the felt slowly relaxing more and more. And um, it's remarkable. It's uh, felt also doesn't, really good felt doesn't pill, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get nappy or anything like that. It just continues to get more and more mellow as it ages. What's the durability of a felt hat? A great felt can last you your whole life. Really? Yeah. I mean, it can, it, it can actually last more than a lifetime. More than a lifetime. It, it can be a heritage piece that's, that's handed down. And so, I mean, you know, a good hat, you know, I mean, it takes time and energy to make. I mean... I mean, how is it in this day and age where not many people are buying hats, you convince them to really invest in quality hats? I mean, how's that conversation been? You know, it, it depends on, on the person, but I, I, I think that um, visiting our store downtown Chicago or, you know, if someone even calls in, we like to get an understanding of what somebody's looking for when they uh, are considering a hat. But usually if they are looking to uh, get an Optimo hat for the first time, or if it's a new customer wearing hats, we um, like to sense their lifestyle. Yeah. What the, you know, why do they want to wear a hat? When do they want to wear it? Uh, talk about the function of it, see how it's going to suit their personal style. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can help design or choose the right hat for our client. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it, it, it's a pretty intuitive process. People tend to know quality when they see it, when they really, really see it. When, if, you, know, you can point out a few details, but the, the more time that they spend with somebody, with something, uh, a product, I think if it's good, you're going to see more and more, the more you look at it and handle it and, and wear it, you can see that this is, you're going to see that quality. You're going to see that, it, that it's well made, the, the passion that goes into mm -hmm. producing it. Uh, when a product is not that way, you'll start to see it slowly fall apart and this doesn't look right and kind of it's self-apparent yeah it's self-apparent yeah. they, they sell themselves to to a degree you know not a lot of people you know my generation are wearing hats so are you seeing more and more kind of people who you know hadn't ever worn hats that didn't grow up with them coming into the store and kind of getting interested in the product it, it's in a way it's nice to be that, that we're wearing and appreciating something that's not common that you don't see everywhere so it's a little bit of an inner but what drives people to find you I mean someone really has to kind of seek Optimo out in many ways I mean it's wor word of mouth and I think that seeing um, other people wearing great hats and they're yeah just kind of we have a lot of people that come in and you know they, they say that they found us because they saw somebody in a, in a great hat and they ask them you know, where they got right, it. Got it. Yeah. So, word of mouth. So what have been some of your kind of more just fun stories of, or interesting stories of people coming in and just kind of some of those moments where you're like, wow, I mean, our hats really are kind of important and it's significant. Yeah. Any, anything, any kind of pinnacle moment where someone just walks into your store and you're like, I can't believe this person just walked into my hat. It's well. We have uh, we make hats for a lot of famous people and, and stuff, and that's really that's really fun. But the the most um, 
what sticks out in my mind is just people coming in and seeing over and over how uh, it's part of their life, part of their lifestyle, mm-hmm. and that it's uh, just kind of who they are. You can't really picture them without their, their head and, and how they share how important it is to them, how serious mm-hmm. they are about it. So it's just something that I think clients have... Um, a lot of fun with, and then there's been a lot of touching stories, you know, people getting buried uh, with one of their optimos and, you know, kids uh, inheriting their parents or grandparents' uh, pieces and, you know, seeing them live on and that kind of stuff is really touching. Yeah. So you guys have a beautiful, uh, you know, flagship in downtown Chicago. Thank um, you. But you guys recently also built an absolutely incredible, you know, factory. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, we were uh, long over it. We really outgrew our original workshop. We had expanded it a couple of times. And um, we found a place, a building. It's an old fire station, uh, a decommissioned fire station that was about a mile away from our original workshop. The space was, uh, we did a little study. The space was perfect to house all of the machines and tools Mm -hmm. that I had collected. We reached out to the iconic uh, architecture firm, SOM, Skidmore Owens, Maryland, uh, based in Chicago. The, it's the smallest factory they ever designed. So they came in. We really took a long time making sure that this was a very purpose-built uh, factory. Mm-hmm. So it's a culmination of all of the tools and equipment that uh, we've invested in over the years. It's taken a while, but it's up and running, and we're producing some phenomenal phenomenal hats but it's an absolutely beautiful I mean it's you know it's an old firehouse it's incredible but it's modern and it's I mean it's unlike anything I've ever seen I mean it's it's you know really such a monument to craftsmanship well it's it's an absolute joy to work in this place and it really uh, I wanted to build a factory that lent itself to higher and higher levels of craft and it's laid out so efficiently and that was a big part of what we wanted to do is, is build a place where we were spending our time not looking for paperwork or uh, where a mold is or materials, mm-hmm. but just focused on the craftsmanship so it could be efficient and really keep us focused. And, but you've got this 100-year-old machinery. I mean, you know, machinery that hasn't been made, you know, in, in, in a century. Yet you walk into the factory and everything looks absolutely brand new and pristine. I mean, it doesn't look like a rundown hat factory. I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, from the factories that I've seen uh, over the years, uh, we wanted to have this purpose built and dedicated to just doing the finest work. So mm-hmm. we want it meticulously clean, dust-free, and there's so many things in the factory that, uh, that we did to ensure that. For example, we have in-floor heating, so we don't have uh, dust being recirculated around the place. The uh, layout of the of the place is, is done in a way where we have all of the tools and equipment necessary for producing that step that we're working on right there. Uh, so it's just a very uh, smooth, uh, it's very smooth way that it's, uh, that, that it's produced, mm-hmm. that, that, that everything uh, goes through the factory. The, uh, I've got my studio there, which is really uh, fun, yeah. and uh, we... Well, that's pretty special, too. Talk a little bit about, you know, your, you've got an incredible vinyl collection. It's well upstairs in my studio. It's, it's a lot of fun. I like, uh, uh, you, you got to visit up there, which is... But so much great. of, I mean, so much I feel of, like, the history of hats is, you know, intersex jazz. I mean, it seems epitomous whenever you think of a hat, you think of... You know, music and yeah, especially in, in Chicago, and that definitely has uh, kind of influenced me. And um, it's in the studio. I, I love working up there. I've got uh, a large display of, of all the r- retired tools and equipment uh, mm-hmm. from my predecessor. So that's a very meaningful piece that I've got there, as well as uh, yeah, the, the vinyl collection, which is really cool. And what was uh, the story? I mean, can you share the story there? I know it, but I'd, I mean, I love jazz, and, and rather than going and buying all the classic uh, albums, I it, it put the word out that if there was ever somebody that had a uh, classic jazz collection, that I would be interested in buying it. And a few years later, I got a phone call, and um, 
it was exactly that. Some uh, somebody had called, said that they had heard I was interested in buying a, a jazz collection, and his father had collected uh, records from 1947 into the 80s. Most of these were in the, uh, classic jazz albums from the 60s. So we're playing that upstairs in the space all the time. It's a huge Eight, collection. 800, 800 records, wow. and and very you know jazz that was a lot of it that was really came out of Chicago and. Um, it's uh, it's kind of yeah it's it's a nice part of the studio and this guy he's like you know made notes kind of on the record so yeah. in some ways I mean like you're going through and you're just just discovering you know this man's passion yeah for his records and it's like you're kind of like reliving it in some ways yeah where he bought it um, his, he checked his favorite songs on on some of these albums and um, yeah it's a trip through Chicago history yeah I've got to have you back over there yeah well we need to go do some videos for sure. So, um, how are you coming along? Well, I'm kind of not thinking about it too yeah, much. Well, we're, yeah, well, we've got better stuff to, uh, to talk about. So, what's I mean, what's next for Opto? I mean, you guys, you know, I mean, if you look at a survey of the world, I mean, there's not many companies out there. I mean, you know, there's a few hat makers in London. You've got still maybe one or two kind of in Italy. But a lot of them have, you know, lost their heritage. I mean, they're no longer manufacturers of hats. And, uh, you know, Optimo, I mean, one of the unique things about Optimo is, you know, you're not just a small workshop with one guy and a few machines that's making one or two hats a week. I mean, you know, you're a factory that's able to produce at higher volumes, which actually, in a lot of ways of what you've described, allows you to make a better hat. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We've got, um, we're, we're always uh, making strides to make better and better um, quality. And... But the machinery allows consistency. I mean, it's one of the things, like, I mean, of course, we deal with, you know, a lot of bespoke shoemaking and suit making. But the moment that you introduce handicraft, you introduce human error and variability, and which ultimately in some ways can limit you, right? Yeah. But, I mean, you've really taken it to kind of the next level in terms of, you know, really going and finding machines that allow you to do a better job more consistently. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, th I think it's the evolution of craft, and I love talking to craftsmen about this, and, and essentially it's just tools, right? And you're always, um, if you want finer and finer ways to do things, you're generally looking for better and better tools on, on how to do this. And um, th what we do is we produce hats in what is traditionally called the handmade method. With certain processes, you absolutely need to have... Um, different tools and machines to, to complete a certain action. But you also need to know what it's supposed to look like and what you're, what you're after. Mm -hmm. And so our focus is, is very specific. We, we don't do caps. We, we make um, a, a range of dress hats that are uh, very classic and traditional, mm -hmm. and, and that's our focus. You know, there's always room for improvement. And it's, uh, I, th I think it's the same path that anybody follows when they're trying to be doing better and better work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess in some ways it's like the Italians, you know, that, you know, like a Keaton or a Brioni. I mean, you know, they're doing absolutely incredible craftsmanship at a very high level. Uh, and a lot of it is because of the tools and I guess for them really the specialization, you know, yeah. where, you know, they're making a lot of suits, but they're able to do it at a super high level because it's controlled and kind of constructed. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I can't really speak to, the, you know, the one thing that dress hats, that's my world. That's mm -hmm. what I really know. But I'm always fascinated with whatever it is um, that's being made, shoes, shirts, suits. Yeah, I, I love it when it's pointed out to me how something is done better. And, and what goes into different things, and a deeper and deeper understanding of all the materials and processes and way that things are things are made. You're doing a great job on those shoes. Well, I'm just kind of fiddling just, with yeah. it here, but I'm. I'm, I'm you got the right idea. I mean, what I'm doing is a high shine, which really, I mean, you could do on those shoes, but it's a little bit. But I've always taken, I've always put a little bit of water yeah. at the end, you know, just some, green, and then and I've, just I've, some I've friction brushed them because. You know, all wax, all shoe polish has waxes, and yeah. uh, you know, a little bit of water and so get a little friction, bit more friction will there. help kind of elevate the shine. I mean, the brush helps, but you know, you could almost just buff it off. You know, using a chamois and a little bit of water, and you'd get, hmm. you know, an even higher shine. I mean, those are kind of coming along, but you've got some interesting materials. I mean, you've got you know felt, of course. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, our, our felt hats are made out of beaver primarily. And why beaver? Like, what's the history there? Well, be beaver uh, is the one of the very f uh, tightest felting, uh, so strongest furs to make hats out of. Okay. But it's it's really important to point out that I mean, some of the it's not just the material, right? You know, it, it has to be w the the material itself has to be milled correctly. Um, and it has to be finished correctly. We do those, and then we also um, specialize in really fine straw hats, money, okay. primarily Monte Cristi Panamas. And, yeah, uh, and I've got one from you that's just absolutely stunning. I've, I've got a Monte Cristi Panama, and then I've got a, a Mylan, yeah. which is a pretty special, apparently rare hat. Um, the, the, yes, these are, they're absolutely rare, and it's also, that, that's the same thing with, I mean, the crafts being uh, disappearing now. Um, I think what, what happens and what the danger with craft is that the quality doesn't maintain. It doesn't, uh, it, the, um, for example, with our straws, I, I found that in, in general, the um, weaves are not made evenly like they used to be mm -hmm. years and years ago. So we spent a tremendous How do you tremendous fight against that? I mean, that's, I mean, because there's this constant, you know, as it becomes more of a niche product and fewer and fewer people are buying it. Yeah. It's harder and harder to find the people that are doing craftsmanship at the highest level. So how do you, I mean, how do you protect your sourcing? And I mean, it's, it, there's no one in Panama making nice straw hats anymore. Well, guess what? There's no more nice hats out there. You know, we, we try to really recognize and buy the, the great stuff and, and, and not, um, you know, we just work with weavers that kind of are understand quality they mm -hmm. they know what we're looking for and we try to really support that and and are you are that. you working with like individual weavers that will only weave hats for you or i mean well, is that like are you developing and yeah it's been 25 years i've been been uh traveling to ecuador and we've been doing the, the same thing a little bit in um in china with the the rare mylands but it's it's difficult to do with small numbers of of, of pieces um and so it's it's a bit of a battle, especially when you know a, a piece can be sold to the tourist market that is sloppy and not understood. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but we've had a lot of of great luck. I think our our Panamas are better than they've ever been. And so we're just slowly developing a network of um, of better and better weavers that um, that we we basically they they we get the hats that they mm -hmm. weave. And so these are collected for us throughout the year and they're um, I, I go to Ecuador pretty fre frequently and then the hats are sent up to uh, to Optimo and then we get them and we process them and turn them into finished hats yeah but uh, I mean true works of art I mean I mean one of those hats I mean you could spend months a year weaving. some of the really really fine ones take take a long time to weave so it's both on the on the felt and on the straw side every piece of our material mm -hmm. and production that we're, we're always trying to, to make better and better. Yeah. So someone that was just looking to get started with hats, I mean, what would your advice to them be? You know, someone that's never worn a hat before, maybe a little bit uncomfortable with the idea, but, you know, but likes, likes the idea of it, what would you say? Where would you steer them? Well, they should, if they want a hat, they should come to Optimo. No, of course. And then once they get there, I mean, I mean, Take their, to take their time and make sure that they are feeling natural or feeling good, they feel right in a certain hat, and to give, to give a little bit of guidance to, mm -hmm. uh, to our team about what, they, uh, what their lifestyle is and yeah. what they're looking for in a great hat. Not bad. Right. No, not bad at all. No. I'm not really... I'm doing less talking that. than you are. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the things, just with my own journey, I mean, I was introduced to you guys through a good close friend, and, uh, you know, initially... You know, I was a little uncomfortable wearing a hat. You know, people look at you. You're not used to wearing it. But you know, the more and more I wear it, the just the more natural it became to yeah. wear in and of itself. And then it, you know, it's gotten to the point where, you know, especially in colder climates, because at the end of the day, a hat, and, you know, first and foremost was pragmatic, right? I mean, it was meant to keep you warm. Yeah, it's a, it's. A, you know, I like to refer to it as a utilitarian luxury. A good hat. It's uh, it should absolutely be. A, uh, a piece that is used and worn, and you shouldn't be afraid of wearing a, a nice felt, a rain, in the snow, and it'll absorb your lifestyle, your personality. Mm -hmm. It can really kind of. Uh, and you don't have to be delicate with it either. I mean. No, yeah, I mean you, you, you know, you don't want to, you know, 
don't necessarily go out of your way to beat it, beat it up, but it's gonna it's gonna Doesn't reflect. Doesn't have to be babied, you, know. you know. No, no. Some, as a matter of fact, sometimes the 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 real look that people are kind of wanting with their hats is what comes with with wearing it. Yeah. What um, and so what about servicing? I mean, hat care. I mean, you have a hat. You know, you know. How do you how do you keep it in your closet? What do you how do you take care of it? What I mean. People talk about servicing hats. I mean, you started out servicing hats. What would you service a hat for? When they're dirty, mainly. Uh, out of shape or dirty. Okay. And the, um, the main thing with our fine straw hats, you want to handle them by the brim. That's, a, that's a, uh, the main thing. I mean, we see most of the damage from grabbing the hat at the, at the crown of the hat. Our felt hats, you know, also try to handle them by the brim and not... Uh, be, don't, don't be too rough grabbing it at the top. That's where we see most of the damage. Otherwise, when the hats come in for service, um, it is usually a deep cleaning, and then the hats are rebuilt on the original molds in which they were made. So you'll take out the lining. Yeah, we'll take everything the out. And they're, um, they're deep cleaned, so all of the deep, and that's very good for a hat. It's not like dry cleaning, which can be very uh, damaging. So, Graham, I mean, how is walking into Optimo different than walking into like a hat store in New Orleans or in, in Dallas or Houston? I mean, are all hat stores pretty much selling the same product, or is the experience the same? You know, I can't, I can't speak to all of the, the hat shops out there, but we're, what's different with Optimo is we, everything that is in Optimo, we make. So these are all of our own hats. We don't sell any other brands. We don't do uh, you know, any, and there's, there's no private label stuff made for us. And these, uh, so if it, if it says the hat with uh, Optimo on it, we've made it in Chicago. Um, and it's what I feel um, a hat shop should really should really be like. I mean, we're always trying to improve and understand more and, and make it a better experience for the client, get a deeper understanding of what uh, what they want, serve the clients better. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think we're very, very focused and, and more serious about you know what, what we're doing as far as uh, in the hat world. Mm -hmm have a lot of clients that, that come in and comment that, you know, it's a, this is, it, it feels like, you know, what a, what a very classic hat shop should be like. Uh, but yet it's unique. I've never really seen uh, a hat shop that, that looks like Optimo. Mm -hmm. um, but we designed it to, um, to really reflect that we're selling a quality product and to, uh, and, and that's where the focus is. Yeah. I mean, does someone need to come, like if I'm interested in an Optimo hat and I know my size, you know, can you sell me a hat, like over the phone or over the internet? Or does someone need to come visit the shop in Chicago? We do a lot of hats over the phone, where we do phone fittings. and um, So you can help someone size over the phone also? Yeah, and we're, we're working on ways to do that better and better. And we can also, uh, we do fittings at trunk shows, like we're doing now. But uh, ideally, if someone's passing through, we, we really at some point like our customers to, um, to stop in in person, whether it's when they order it or whether we're checking up on something that we made for them mm -hmm. uh, at some point, just to make sure that it's, it's right on. Yeah. And we're really particular about fit and that the, that the stuff looks good. They may find a, a hat that they really like and looks good, but there may be something that's even better, you know, that's really, really You guys have a lot of one-offs. I mean, a lot of low, you know, not low production volume, but a lot of special really beautiful colors of felt that, uh, yeah. you know, that are, you've got five hat bodies. Yeah. yeah, we've, and so you can see that kind of stuff in, yeah. the, in the store. We have um, about 12 um, core styles that we do, but there's also really endless options when you think of all of the different edgings that we ribbons. can do on hats yeah. and ribbons. And, um, so you can see all of that when you when you come in, and we can get really particular with the person's fit, mm -hmm. and make some notes for their file, and if they come in and buy a hat, they get an idea of the the, the next one and the one after that, and the one after that that they want to buy as well. So that's kind of yeah, that's kind of fun. Yeah, great. Well, Graham, you know, thank you so much for kind of your passion and for taking such great care of me with my hats and. Uh, for joining us. So if anyone uh, wants to learn more about Optima, you know, of course you're on Instagram, beautiful Instagram, you know, you know page. And then I guess Optimo, what, Optimo? Optimo.com. Optimo.com. Yeah, and they can, of course, always call the store, mm -hmm. too. 
and uh, and, and if they're passing you. through Chicago, I mean, it's uh, I'll stop by for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, well Graham, Kirby, thank thank, so much. thank you so much, yeah. and uh, maybe after uh, we Beautiful cut this, let's. Uh, I wanna I wanna get more teaching on your <laughs> technique here. Your shoe looks a little a little better than mine. Well, that's less nice. Less talking over here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Cool, man. Well, thanks. All right. Thank you.